Okay, let's get started. Um, my internet has been flaky today, so I'm recording this ahead of time in hopes that it will work and it will not flake out during a live lecture today, which probably wouldn't go very well. So that's why we're not uh, live today. Let me get my screen share going here. And here we go. Okay, last time we continued talking about cartilage, um, distinguished between the load on cartilage and, and the uh, stress induced uh, on cartilage by that load. Um, most of our, uh, and that topic is important because most of our knowledge of what's called the fatigue life of cartilage in terms of uh, how many loading cycles at certain intensities of loading it can sustain before it's damaged and then at least has a, a mechanical definition of osteoarthritis. Um, most of our knowledge of, of that relationship of the fatigue life of cartilage is known in terms of the uh, stress on cartilage with each cycle, not in terms of the load on cartilage in each cycle. Um, also covered or wrapped up last time covering some possible explanations for uh, running and knee osteoarthritis or for the lack of uh, seeming lack of a causal relationship between running and uh, knee osteoarthritis, even though running places very large loads on the cartilage and seemed like the best uh, available explanation there, at least for now, and at least from a biomechanics perspective is that in living cartilage, um, mechanical loading or the mechanical stresses of uh, running induce some sort of positive beneficial physiological adaptation to cartilage uh, that, that strengthens it, strengthens it kind of like we uh, consider like exercising a muscle and uh, providing it proper rest and nutrition resulting in a stronger muscle. It seems like that might also to some extent um, also extend to cartilage, which I think is a pretty attractive explanation for uh, the benefits of something like uh, running or like exercise in general on uh, protecting your joints in the long term and not not necessarily destroying them in the long term, which should should be good news uh, for all of us who who like to exercise. Um, we'll largely elaborate on uh, these topics today, and this will be a fairly short lecture. This just kind of extends uh, some of the topics that we talked about last time. We'll talk about what an injury is uh, structurally. Uh, which doesn't just relate to cartilage and to osteoarthritis, but within the context here of, of cartilage and osteoarthritis. And uh, also then uh, revisit some explanations here for why cartilage appears to be pretty well suited uh, for withstanding large amounts of mechanical loading, even though we typically uh, deem large amounts of mechanical loading to possibly be injurious or possibly be a, a negative thing uh, for the tissues of our body and for cartilage uh, specifically. Um, here's a link to a nice reading to take a look at, and this isn't assigned or anything. I'm not going to, you know, do a pop quiz or anything over this reading. Um, but if you're not super familiar with uh, cartilage in terms of the science of it and the anatomy and function of it, um, I'm not sure how much your A and P classes focus on on those kind of details. And so, if you're not intimately familiar with what cartilage is made of, how it functions, what it does in the body. Uh, what are some, some of the diseases that cartilage gets and what happens when we lose some of that function. Uh, this is a nice, uh, fairly accessible reading uh, from the NIH on, uh, on the PubMed website here uh, that goes over just some of the basic science of, of cartilage there. So I'd recommend taking a look um, at that one. Now we're talking here primarily when we talk about the health of cartilage in relation to mechanical loading and things like osteoarthritis. Um, again here, and you've seen this slide, I think for the last three or four lectures here, talking about the loads that are placed on cartilage, these uh, contact forces that I've highlighted in red here um, on the cartilage on the medial and lateral side of the knee, um, which are loaded up like that in, in basically any weight bearing activity. Um, primarily, it'll be the medial side of the joint here that bears most of this kind of total load of cartilage. Like if you sum up uh, these two arrows I've highlighted in red here, um, in walking, they'll add up to maybe like three times your body weight every step you take. In running, they'll add up to, depending on how fast you're going, maybe five to 10 times your body weight every step you take. Um, all of that three-ish pound or multiples body weight in walking or all of that eight-ish multiple body weights in, in uh, running won't all be on the medial side, but typically for most of the gait cycle and uh, around that, that peak load, the majority of it will be uh, on the medial side. So if you're walking, uh, the peak medial contact force on your knee might be like two to three times body weight and the peak lateral contact force on your knee might be like uh, 0.5 to 1.5 body weights or something like that. So generally most of that load is borne uh, by the medial side of the knee and that tends to be where we most commonly uh, see osteoarthritis in the knee where it, where it experiences uh, the greatest loading on the joint. 
Now, osteoarthritis is a complex disease. It's not just about cartilage and it's not uh, just about mechanical loading, um, but it is something that it are, th those are things that are major factors in osteoarthritis, the progressive loss and progressive damage of the solid part, the collagen part here of uh, cartilage, typically starting up here at the articular surface and then developing these fissures uh, deeper and deeper into the cartilage through uh, damage and breaking of these little black lines here, which are the collagen fibers, kind of the uh, structural solid springy part of uh, cartilage. And we typically think that that damage is, is resulting in whole or in part um, from mechanical overload of cartilage, from wear and tear, from, from overusing the cartilage, loading it uh, with too high a loading levels for too long a time for too many loading cycles, uh, resulting in an accumulation of damage over time and eventually resulting mechanically in a injury. Um, osteoarthritis is not an injury. It's a, it's a chronic disease and a complex one, but again, mechanical loading has been strongly implicated in its uh, development and especially uh, in its progression. And this figure here that I keep showing you seemingly every lecture for the last two weeks or so uh, just kind of backs that up. This is again, the relationship between the uh, peak load in terms of the uh, maximum stress that you place on cartilage um, in a loading cycle. And then on the y-axis, how many times it can sustain that stress uh, before it's damaged, before it ruptures or before it breaks. Okay. But notice here, we see if we're at the fairly low levels of stress here, like zero to 20%, then we don't see any samples failing. And the ones that were tested, no samples of cartilage failing there. And the ones that were tested at those fairly low stress levels here, these little triangles, um, they did 100,000 loading cycles and did not break, did not rupture. Now, would they have lasted for a million loading cycles? We don't know, they weren't tested there. Were they, would they last for tens of million or hundreds of million loading cycles, which is what we'd be talking about over like a human lifespan? Don't know. All we can say is they lasted for 100,000 loading cycles. So suggesting there is some at least theoretical evidence here that maybe really low stresses that we might expect experience in walking and perhaps in running um, are things that we can sustain over a lifetime without any serious mechanical consequences in terms of developing osteoarthritis uh, strictly from those loads. But we do see some pretty clear evidence here that all other factors being equal, too much mechanical stress over too many loading cycles is possibly a bad thing here for the mechanical health of the cartilage. Now let's revisit this uh, term here, stress, that we introduced last time. Um, notice on the y-axis, if I back up a slide here, the loading level here is expressed as percent S. And what is that exactly? Um, I keep saying loading level just because they used loading level here, but it wasn't actually loads or force that they investigated uh, in this study. Load in mechanics is a synonym for force, or at least it's a, a type of force, a force placed on, a, on an object that tends to deform it and move it. Um, what they actually investigated here was stress, the stress placed on these, or the peak stresses placed on these little samples of cartilage with every loading cycle. Um, it's expressed here from zero to 100%. 100% um, here would be the, um, what's called the strength of the cartilage, or the ultimate strength of it. Um, the stress that you could place on it with one single tremendous bout of loading that would damage it. And depending on a variety of factors, that, that max like single load strength of a tissue like cartilage is typically around 50 megapascals or so. And so if you're looking for stresses that are low on cartilage in terms of low enough here to reach this, this run out level here, they are talking about maybe 10 to 20% of that 50 megapascals. So maybe like five to uh, 10 megapascals here would be um, our hypothetical like endurance limit for cartilage, where if we're below that level, we can sustain uh, many, 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 many thousands of loading cycles of, of that stress level of maybe five to 10 megapascals uh, without any serious risk of damage. But nonetheless, we're looking at stresses here. And just to review, what is uh, stress? Well, it's the force that's applied to a structure divided by the area that sees that force, or the area that the force is spread out over. So a couple of ways here, just intuitively, that we could have a low stress. You could have a low force, or you could have a moderate force, even a high force, that's spread out over a big area. Or if you want to get a really low stress, you could have uh, low values of both of these things, a small force that's spread out over a big area. Okay? So just because we have a high force that's placed on a body or on a tissue like cartilage doesn't necessarily mean we have a high stress. The geometry of the 
uh, part of the body or the part of the tissue that's being loaded is also a big factor there. That would be what would come into play uh, with this area that the forces experienced by are spread out um, over here. And so that's one of the reasons why if you get into the uh, tissue biomechanics literature, you'll generally see people making statements like stress is a better indicator of potential damage and potential injury to a tissue uh, than load. Um, the main reason for that, at least my read on the main reason for that, is that nearly all of our knowledge of what types of load kind of regimes that a tissue like cartilage can withstand before it's damaged is not actually known in terms of load, it's known like this in terms of stress. Okay. So it's not really like a theory that stress somehow mechanistically is more damaging or more directly indicating a risk for damage than force. Um, it seems to me to be more so just related that we know a heck of a lot more about how tissues respond to various stress levels than we do uh, about various uh, force levels. So generally speaking, if you wanna forecast the risk of injury to a structure like cartilage, and you can pick, do you wanna know the force on it or do you wanna know the stress on it? You should pick the stress on it because most of the, the knowledge of how tissues do or do not get damaged by, by certain loads is actually known in terms of the stress induced by those loads, not the loads themselves. Now, closely related to stress is strain. And what is strain exactly? This is another one of these uh, mechanics terms that you've probably heard before, but maybe have not formally had defined for you in any course that you've taken previously. Um, strain is a kinematic variable. It's related to movement. And stress is a kinetic variable. It's related to forces. Um, strain is the result of stress. So it's kind of the tissue mechanics level relationship between like force and motion. You apply a force to something, it accelerates that something and moves it. Um, the relationship between stress and strain is similar there. You apply a stress to something, it typically deforms that something and that deformation, the deformation or change in shape or change in length, they're just more general, you know, change in what the thing looks like is uh, referred to as strain. So you apply a strain to something, it deforms that something, that amount of deformation, or it's just rough change in shape is the strain of that something. So you can think of strain, at least one dimensionally here, as a change in the characteristic length of a structure. Um, for example, you take a rubber band, you pull on it, and you elongated it. Um, you take a sponge and you press on it, and you uh, compressed it. In both cases, you are straining that rubber band by stretching it, or you are also straining that uh, sponge by compressing it, by changing its length. Um, I can give you a, a visual example here. Um, I've got a, a little piece of foam right here. So if you look down the cross section of it and consider that, you know, this might be a cross section of like a piece of cartilage. Let's pretend this is cartilage instead of foam. Um, when I take it with my fingers here and pinch it, I'm applying loads to it with my fingers. I'm applying uh, those loads on particular areas here on the side of it that are touched by my fingers. Um, you could take those forces or the loads from my fingers and divide them by those areas and add them up and that'd be the stress I'm applying to this thing. And what results from that stress? Well, it's deformation. I compressed that thing. So I you know, pinched it here with my fingers and compressed it by maybe, a, I don't know, maybe a centimeter or so. So I induced about one centimeter change in the characteristic length or the unloaded length of this cross section of foam here or of cartilage here, if you want to think of this as a more uh, biological example. So you'll typically see strain not expressed as like an absolute change in length, like I described it there as I compressed it by one centimeter. Um, you'll typically see strain expressed as a percent change in length. Like rather than saying you strained this thing by one centimeter, you'll see strain described as being 1% or 10%, you know, 50%. .50%. Um, what is that percent? It's typically the change in length relative to the unloaded length or the resting length, which is the length the thing would have uh, when there's no strains on it, or when there's no stresses on it, when there's no forces applied to it. So just it's resting unloaded length. Um, for example, the cross section of this thing is maybe about two centimeters wide there. And if I take my fingers and I press on it until it's compressed by one centimeter, um, I compressed it by one centimeter. Its resting length was two centimeters. 
And so I imposed about a 50% strain on that thing. One centimeter is 50% of two centimeters. And so I compressed it by 50% of its resting length. Um, how big are strains in the body? Is 10% is a lot? Is 50% a lot? Um, for most tissues of the body, a 50% strain would be very, very large. That would probably be a strain um, associated with like a uh, single traumatic load damage to a structure. Not necessarily for all structures, but like if you strain any tendon by 50% or any bone or any muscle fiber by 50%, you've probably completely torn that, that tissue of the body. Um, cartilage, maybe, maybe not. Cartilage is a little bit different, but still our strains on the body are typically not very big most of the time. Um, bone is really stiff and not completely rigid, but much more close to being completely rigid than the softer parts of the body. So strains in bone are typically measured as like micro strains. They're not, not very big. Um, tendon might typically deform by like four to 10% based on the uh, forces applied to it during normal human movements. So uh, a 10% strain or 10% stretch of a tendon beyond its resting length would, would be, you know, the, the, the stretches associated with like one rep max weightlifting or like sprinting at max speed and stuff like that. If you get up into like 12, 13, 14, 15, 20% strain on a tendon, that, that's probably an injury situation. Um, cartilage, what are strains on cartilage in activities like walking, you know, sit to stand, climbing stairs, playing sports, uh, typically in the ballpark of like five to, to 30%. Okay. So strains in the body generally aren't all that big, uh, well under 100% most of the time, well under 50% most of the time. A little bit bigger for squishy stuff like cartilage than for stuff like tendon or certainly like bone. But, but typically, if you see strains in the body that are approaching like 50 to 100% resting length, those are really big strains, no matter what, what tissue you're looking at, whether it's bone or tendon or cartilage. Now, like I said last time, qualitatively, stress is related to strain. You apply a load to something, that load gets spread out over a particular area, which gives you the stress, the ratio between those things. And that stress mechanically causes deformation or causes a strain um, of that area or of that tissue that it's applied to. Um, that stress strain relationship, that mechanical relationship between how much stress, sigma, causing a certain amount of strain, epsilon here. These are just the Greek symbols typically used to abbreviate these things. Um, what's that relationship look like? Um, stress, sigma, is typically described as being equal to strain, epsilon, times this big goofy looking E here. And what is that E exactly? Um, in mechanics, the kind of scaling factor here between how much stress, sigma, causes a certain amount of strain, epsilon, is the modulus of elasticity here. Okay. Um, it's a complicated material property of various tissues in the body or just various various materials that are, that are loaded and deformed by certain amounts. So I'm not going to do it full justice here. But generally speaking, you can think of modulus of elasticity as reflecting the stiffness of the material here. Um, the stiffer the material is, the, the more stress you have to apply to it to strain it by a, a unit amount, the higher E here is going to be, or the higher the modulus of elasticity is going to be, uh, the more intrinsic stiffness that material um, is going to have. Um, so if we're looking at, say, bone, which is very stiff, we would expect that to have a high material stiffness and a high modulus of elasticity um, compared to looking at, say, uh, tendon or looking at cartilage, which are softer and less stiff and would have a smaller uh, modulus of elasticity than, than something more rigid and stiffer uh, like bone. Um, often that relationship is linear, which is this first equation here, meaning that if I uh, increase my stress by 10%, I also increase my strain by 10%. Um, often though, most relationships in biology like this are nonlinear, and we'll see uh, more complex relationships here between uh, exactly how much strain you get for a, a certain amount of stress here. It's often uh, parabolic or logarithmic or just nonlinear uh, in general. Um, but regardless of if it's a linear relationship like this simple one here or a more complex nonlinear relationship like this one here, um, generally speaking, the more stress you apply to something, the greater the strain results uh, from that stress, gen generally speaking. Now, this gets into the notion of our first uh, review question for today, which is which particular variable from mechanics is the best indicator 
of an actual injury or, or kind of long-term lasting damage to that structure. Um, this kind of gets into what do we mean here by injury? You know, what's, what's the definition of injury? Um, in mechanics, an injury is the accumulation of damage. And what is damage exactly? Um, damage you can think of as what's called plastic deformation. Um, let me give you an example of what's not plastic deformation by, by looking at our, our cross section here of foam. I take this thing and I squish it. And as long as I'm squishing it, as long as I'm stressing it, I'm straining it, okay? So right now, while I'm applying stresses to it, I'm straining it, I'm deforming it, okay? Um, what happens though, when I remove that stress, it pretty quickly goes back to its original shape, okay? Um, so what I was doing there when I was deforming it like this, so I apply a stress, I deform it, I strain it, I let it go, it goes back to its original shape. Um, the type of deformation I was inducing there is elastic deformation, okay? meaning when I stress it, it changes its shape, it strains, but when I remove that mechanical stimulus, when I remove that stress, it goes back to its original shape. There is no permanent lasting change in its structure, and from that we might presume no permanent uh, lasting or long-term change to its function from that stress that I imposed on it. Um, where it would become injurious, where it would become damaging, is if I stressed it repeatedly so much, or if I stressed it with really, really, really big stresses, such that when I removed that stress, it did not return to its original shape. It was uh, permanently uh, damaged or permanently, permanently deformed uh, after, even after removing that stress. Okay? Um, that's called plastic deformation which is a, a long lasting strain, a, a change in the resting length or resting shape of that tissue. Um, a good example I can give you there is if you bend a piece of paper versus carrying a piece of paper. So here I've just got a simple Kleenex. And if I take this Kleenex and I stress it by just crumpling it up there, then I've very clearly changed its shape though, right? but it wasn't a permanent change in shape. I can put it back to normal, okay? So there it is, generally speaking, recovered from that stress that I imposed on it and from that uh, strain that I imposed on it without any long lasting permanent change to its, its structure and its function. And you can look at it closely and say, Dr. Miller, you put a bunch of little tiny creases and crinkles in it. So there does appear to be you know, some, some long lasting changes to it after that stress that I applied to it, but they'd probably go back to normal eventually, right? Like I could take it overnight and you know, squeeze it between two textbooks or something like that. And it'd probably return more or less to what its original shape was out of the box there. Okay, so I can take it and bend it and crumple it, and that's just temporary strain. When I remove the, uh, the, the stimulus there, it goes back to its original shape. If I take it though and strain it in a different way like this, then it's torn, right? Then it's ripped. It can't go back to normal. It's, it's damaged permanently, okay? So that's kind of the difference here between elastic deformation, which is not mechanically an injury, and plastic deformation, which is mechanically an injury. Doesn't necessarily always result in like rupture or tearing like this, that's, that's kind of an extreme example, but uh, an injury here or damage is plastic deformation, a strain that sticks around in the long term or maybe even permanently after the stress that caused that strain um, is removed. So if you are going to forecast the risk of injury for something, and you want to rank order like which variables from biomechanics are the best indicator of those things. Um, generally speaking, you want to know the strain because that's the closest thing to you know, the, the plastic deformation that you might see. Um, if you can't know the strain, you'd want to know the stress. And if you can't know either of these things, then you'd probably just want to know the load. Okay? So what's the best kind of indicator or predictor of future injury or future accumulation of damage? Number one would be strain. Uh, number two, pretty close behind strain would be stress. And number three, a distant third would be the load that causes those things. Not to say the load's not important, right? The load's kind of the whole driver, the whole thing. But if you want to know, is this damaging and injurious? You'd rather know the strain. If you can't know the strain, you'd rather know the stress than just simply knowing the load. 
Okay, that's all just kind of generally speaking, it's, you know, about loading and stress and strain of tissues in the body in general. Um, specifically for osteoarthritis, if we're looking structurally at the main tissue that this disease affects in the joint, which is the cartilage of the joint, um, often you will see osteoarthritis being characterized structurally by damage to the cartilage, by long lasting uh, strains and changes in the shape of the cartilage um, affecting the function of that joint. Um, you'll typically see damage in articular cartilage if you get into like the osteoarthritis literature referred to as fissures or cracks or lesions is a common term. And so if you see these terms in the osteoarthritis literature in this, in this class, um, this is what they're referring to here over on the right. Okay? Um, a, a very early stage grade of structural osteoarthritis, if you're looking at say a bone, like this might be my tibia down here, and then this kind of fluffy part would be my cartilage up there. Um, very early on, you might look like you have a large amount of, of healthy functional cartilage here, but if you look on like an MRI or something like that, you might see kind of just a weird looking little abrasion here, you know, like a, a blister, just a part of the cartilage that doesn't quite look right. Um, over time, if it's, you know, developed into osteoarthritis here, you'll see going from grade one to grade two here, that cartilage deteriorating and developing into some kind of localized uh, clefts or fissures into the cartilage here. Um, as it progresses further, there'll be more and more fissures and deeper and deeper fissures. And uh, down to the extreme uh, case here where this would be a, a very severe case of osteoarthritis, not necessarily the most severe because they still have some cartilage here. Um, but here you have fissures that are large in size and all the way down to the surface of the bone there, which is typically quite painful uh, when that surface gets loaded and, and comes into contact uh, with other surfaces. Now, does that damage there that you see on that previous slide, does that necessarily result from mechanical overloading of cartilage like we see demonstrated here in, in this figure I keep showing you? Um, sometimes, yes, there's some evidence that uh, placing loads on the knee that are too high by some definition uh, is associated with the progression of knee osteoarthritis. So suppose you start, if I go back here, suppose you start here at grade two and progress here to three and then to four, um, does mechanical loading affect the risk for or the rate of progression there from like a mild case to a severe end stage case? Um, I'm pretty confident in saying yes. There's quite a bit of evidence that placing high loads on a grade two surface here is a risk factor for progressing to grade three and grade four here. Um, however, is progressing from grade zero, which you don't see here, to grade one or progressing from grade one here, which may or may not actually be osteoarthritis to grade two here, is mechanical loading a risk factor for that? That's less convincing. Remember, there's not a lot of evidence that runners with healthy cartilage develop osteoarthritis. There's not a lot of evidence that athletes or people that participate at least at a recreational level in most sports have a high risk for osteoarthritis. So it seems like at least in a healthy state here before we've developed any clear osteoarthritis, cartilage is pretty good at sustaining mechanical loads, even very high mechanical loads. So I wanted to wrap up today with just some uh, ho hopefully a, a positive spin on the idea that you may be getting now that loading your cartilage is bad. It's not. I um, wanted to, to just give a, a, a biomechanical perspective here to, to wrap up today on how cartilage is actually really good at sustaining high mechanical loads, at least in a healthy state. If it's an osteoarthritic joint or if it's cartilage that's damaged from like a traumatic injury to the joint, then maybe some other factors are in play there and then maybe too high mechanical loads can be bad. But in a healthy state, cartilage is actually really good at sustaining mechanical loads, even really high mechanical loads. And then how does it do that exactly? Um, one factor to consider here is the mode of failure in cartilage. Um, at least from a structural perspective here, cartilage is comprised of these collagen fibers, these, these kind of uh, strands of this elastic kind of springy material that comprise the solid part of cartilage here. And superficially, if we think of uh, osteoarthritis developing first here at the top of the cartilage, developing little fissures and clefts there and then proceeding gradually through time down to the, the surface of the bone here, which is when it gets painful, um, that will develop initially at the surface here by rupturing those fibers, by stretching them, pulling them too far, as if you're pulling a rubber band or like a fitness band too far, stretching it further and further and further and snapping it eventually. Okay? So if you want to think about fissures developing here on the surface of cartilage, that would essentially result 
from taking these little bands or these fibers of collagen on the surface here and pulling them repeatedly too far to induce damage in them that would eventually cause them to rupture. And then if many of them rupture, then you get a little blister or cleft on the surface there that then widens and widens down uh, to the bone surface down here. So we could think of a superficial damage or kind of the structural initiation of osteoarthritis here as cracks here that are perpendicular to the orientation of these fibers. Um, this is a bad thing if it happens because the cartilage on its own won't naturally try to heal that damage. Um, one nice thing about cartilage is it has no connection to the nervous system. So nothing telling it that it's painful when it's being loaded. This is why you can, you know, play sports and jump up and down on one, le one leg and load the heck out of your knee and nothing hurts. Um, but then a bad thing there is that when it is damaged, there's nothing telling the nervous system, hey, I'm, I'm damaged, come help me out here. Um, also, it doesn't have any direct blood supply most of the time, uh, meaning even if it could sense that it was damaged, it doesn't have a way to directly get you know, blood and nutrients there to help repair that damage. So if it is damaged, it won't uh, naturally heal. Um, fortunately, that superficial loading of the cartilage tends to not stretch those superficial fibers in that parallel damaging direction very heavily or very often. The input to that surface there is primarily a compressive load, like we see in that picture of the knee that I keep showing you at the start of the lectures here. Um, that will tend to primarily compress this little chunk of cartilage that you see here which will, based on you know, some of the geometry involved and the fact that the whole thing is attached to the bone down there and is kind of confined, confined in terms of its volume and shape, it will stretch them a little bit in that lateral direction, but still the majority of that strain resulting from that superficial compressive load and compressive stress will be in that compressive direction. So there won't be a great deal of tension and a great deal of like lateral strain and stretching on those superficial fibers up there, even when it's a really heavy compressive load there. So long story short is that one of the, the big mechanical factors here that allows cartilage to sustain heavy compressive mechanical loads is the orientation of the collagen fibers and particularly the parallel orientation of the fibers at the surface of the cartilage here that experiences those uh, superficial compressive loads and compressive stresses. Um, re even if it's a really large load there at that surface, it's not typically going to result in a great deal of like uh, stretching tension and, and stretching strain and stress on, on those collagen fibers at the surface there. Okay, another factor to consider here in terms of cartilage being really good at sustaining mechanical loading is all that stuff that I just talked about there for the, the orientation of the collagen fibers is referring specifically to collagen, the, sol the main solid kind of macroscopic solid piece of cartilage. Um, cartilage is not just composed of collagen and it's not just composed of solid stuff. Um, a common term or common terms here that you'll see used to describe the uh, structural mechanics of uh, cartilage is that it's biphasic and it's, this is a big one, stay with me here, biphasic and poroviscoelastic. So what the heck do those things mean? What does biphasic mean? And what does poroviscoelastic mean? Uh, both of these things are important for explaining why cartilage, at least healthy cartilage, is really good at sustaining heavy cyclical compressive mechanical loads. But what are these things? What does that mean exactly? And how do they help it sustain heavy cyclical mechanical loads from like running or like from exercise? Um, biphasic, bi means just a fancy word for two. And phasic is referring to the fact that cartilage consists of two phases of matter. There's the solid phase, which is typically referred to as the extracellular matrix. And that consists of the collagen, which we've talked about before, which gives cartilage its general structure, kind of springy, elastic behavior and shape. Um, that solid phase also consists of uh, a protein called proteoglycans, which interacts with the collagen to uh, give the collagen its, its, uh, its intrinsic stiffness, that modulus of elasticity from before, and its ability to absorb energy, to uh, convert uh, energy from different to and from different mechanical types of energy. So that's just one of the phases of, of uh, cartilage. Um, extracellular, what does extracellular mean? Um, it means uh, other than cellular. Um, cartilage only has one type of cell inside it. It's these little guys right here. Uh, that are chondrocytes, and 
the uh, extracellular matrix exists separate from, from those cells. Um, the chondrocytes here, we'll talk about them quite a bit when we get down to the cellular level of, of class here. Um, the chondrocytes are uh, critical for regulating the health of the extracellular matrix here. So they uh, secrete the stuff and are generally responsible for the uh, metabolism of cartilage that maintains a healthy extracellular matrix and a healthy structure and function of collagen and, and healthy proteoglycans. If you're wondering what this term extracellular means, it means it's uh, other than the cells that comprise uh, cartilage here, the chondrocytes. But regardless of that, cartilage is not just solid stuff, it's also liquid stuff. Okay? Um, cartilage is bathed in a, a bath of fluid that may just look like water, but it's not just water, it's referred to broadly speaking as synovial fluid. Um, I keep mentioning several times that cartilage is a little unique from most tissues in the body because it has no direct nervous system connection and no direct circulatory system connection. So how does cartilage get any nutrition to it? Well, it's from this synovial fluid. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer that cartilage doesn't have a blood supply. It doesn't have a direct blood supply, but it does have an indirect blood supply. Um, there is a synovial membrane that surrounds our joints that does have a blood supply. And from that blood supply, it's able to trigger metabolism that produces and secretes this synovial fluid into the joint there. Okay? So cartilage does kind of have a blood supply that ultimately provides it with nutrients. It just doesn't have a direct blood supply. There's not like uh, direct uh, uh, like, like uh, capillaries and stuff that go into cartilage itself. Um, but it does get bathed in a synovial fluid, which is produced by another tissue adjacent to the cartilage, which does have a blood supply. So this liquid phase, this synovial fluid, is important at a cellular level for nutrient delivery, for regulating the health of cartilage. We'll talk about that more later. Um, at the macroscopic mechanical level there, uh, the liquid phase is super, super important. Um, it's responsible along with uh, the, the solid phase here, kind of working together to provide cartilage with its damping abilities, with its energy absorption. And it's also responsible for the lubrication of cartilage, which makes it really low friction and makes me able to do these nice smooth movements of my joints without a lot of friction there uh, inside my joint. Um, this is also really helpful for uh, having a lubricated joint here, really helpful for having these compressive loads that I place on the surface of cartilage, not getting translated into shear loads, into frictional loads, grinding and twisting loads on cartilage. Um, the example you can think of there is imagine taking like two pieces of sandpaper and twisting them together like that. There'd be a lot of resistance and a lot of friction. And that's the type of loading that would snap these little collagen fibers really quickly. Um, if you think about taking uh, two really lubricated slippery surfaces and sliding them together, like uh, take a take a bolus of, uh, I don't know, something really slippery like uh, uh, cooking oil, like uh, like the, the olive oil or something like that and put it on the surface of your hands and twist them around like that. It's really slippery. It doesn't generate a lot of friction there. Not a lot of shearing, not a lot of frictional forces. So not a lot of shear loading of, of the surface here of the cartilage. Um, enabled at the macroscopic level by this synovial uh, fluid, which lubricates this uh, solid part of the cartilage here and allows it to not have a lot of shear and frictional loading that might snap these little fibers, uh, even when it's experiencing heavy compressive loading. Okay, so that's biphasic. It's got a solid part and it's got a fluid part. And the fluid part, not that they're one's more important than the other, but the fluid part is really important for working with the solid part for helping it absorb mechanical loads and helping it have a low friction interface there when it does sustain high mechanical loads. Um, what does this other term here mean, this poro visoelastic business? Um, poro is a fancy word for meaning permeable, meaning this uh, synovial fluid is kind of behaving or interacting with the cartilage in a sponge-like way. It gives it kind of a spongy nature, meaning the fluid can secrete and go in and out of cartilage based on how it's being mechanically loaded. Okay? Um, that permeable nature of cartilage, meaning that the fluid can go in and out during mechanical loading, is really important for nutrient transport. Um, it's also really important for sustaining high loads on the cartilage uh, without large strains on the structural part, on the solid part, on the collagen itself. Um, by being a uh, poroviscoelastic here, when you smash the cartilage with a load, you can sustain a lot of that load and a lot of that stress 
on this solid or on this liquid part and not on the solid part. You can uh, compress it and squeeze out some of that liquid part. But because it's not completely permeable, because it's only kind of permeable, you don't just squeeze it and it all squishes out right away. You squeeze it and it develops some hydrostatic pressure in that liquid part that resists that mechanical load and absorbs some of that load on the liquid part without imposing it on the solid part. And so this is why having a, a, a lubricated, uh, kind of well hydrated cartilage is a good thing. Uh, visco, the other term here, is a fancy word for damping, which relates to its ability to dissipate energy. And elastic here is a fancy word for springy, meaning it helps it sustain, Sickler is responsible for helping it sustain uh, cyclical mechanical loads by springing back to its original shape after it's de deformed, at least among reasonable amounts of deformation. So poro viscoelastic is highlighting three important elements here of cartilage. Um, it's permeable to that fluid, meaning it's sponge-like. Um, it's damped, meaning that it's really good at uh, absorbing mechanical loading. And it's springy, meaning that it's really good at returning to its original shape without any lasting deformation, even from really heavy compressive mechanical loads and mechanical stresses. Um, all of these things here add up to a really important mechanical phenomenon of cartilage in that the faster you load it, the stiffer it gets. Okay. Um, this is important because when we're placing heavy loads on cartilage, we're also typically placing them faster on the cartilage. Like if I run at faster and faster speeds from like a slow jog up to a max sprint, um, yes, each step I take is typically a greater peak load on my joints, but I'm also typically doing it faster and faster and applying those bigger loads faster and faster. Okay. So largely due to this damping effect, but kind of due to all three of these things working in, in sequence with each other, um, as you load a structure like cartilage faster and faster, it gets stiffer and stiffer. Um, you can think of it as that, that big E variable in the stress strain relationships a few slides ago is not just a static fixed value. Um, how stiff it is depends on how fast you're loading it. And the faster that you apply a load to cartilage, the stiffer it gets. Why is this beneficial? Well, if you examine those equations mathematically, the stiffer something is, the less strain you're gonna get for a given stress. So even though when we load a tissue like cartilage with greater and greater peak loads and faster and apply those loads faster and faster, we might expect that to result in more and more strain, it doesn't. If cartilage has a healthy poro viscoelastic structure here, if it does, then it gets stiffer the faster you load it, doing, owing largely to its fluid content and this viscous nature, um, getting stiffer the faster it gets loaded and causing less strain for a given stress. Okay? So it's impossible to run at faster speeds without placing greater peak loads on your cartilage. It is possible to run at faster speeds while having more or less the same strain on your cartilage because of this poro viscoelastic nature and the tendency for cartilage to get stiffer when you load it faster and load it with, with larger peak loads. Now, this to me is one of the coolest things about uh, cartilage and that its uh, mechanical behavior is not this kind of fixed inner thing. It doesn't just have a particular stiffness and it always has that stiffness. Um, basically, it behaves as stiff as it needs to given the circumstances of how it's, it's loaded. Um, countries that are a lot smarter than us, the United States, build speed bumps like cartilage. I hate speed bumps. There's a bunch of speed bumps all over my community and I hate driving over them. And I especially hate riding my bike over them. You, you know, imagine going down a hill at say 20 miles an hour, which is pretty slow in a car, but pretty fast in a bike and you're bouncing over all these speed bumps. Um, wouldn't it be cool if the speed bump was only there when you're driving too fast? Like the speed limit on the road that I'm talking about here is 25 miles per hour. There's a lot of uh, residences along the road. A lot of kids like to like ride their bikes and skateboards along the road and they don't want people driving too fast there above the speed limit because it might be dangerous, very, very reasonable thing to be worried about. So they put some speed bumps there. But wouldn't it be nice if the speed bump um, only was there and only bumped you when you were driving too fast? Um, if it's just a big rigid lump of concrete, can't do that, right? But what if we built speed bumps like cartilage that were really, really soft if you were driving slowly over them but then got stiffer and stiffer and stiffer the faster you drove over them. So they only gave you a bump when you were driving too fast over them. Um, some countries, I believe this is a video of some uh, speed bumps in uh, Spain 
build uh, speed bumps like that, mimicking the effect of cartilage in that the faster you drive over it and the faster you load it, the stiffer it gets and the bigger the bump it gives you. <clears throat> Whether you respect the speed limits or not, you and your car will suffer from the conventional speed bumps anyway. In order to end the driver's everyday frustration, we have created the BIV, the first intelligent speed bump. Traveling at a moderate speed, the soft bump yields. If you drive too fast, however, the speed bump becomes an obstacle. The intelligence. So what's going on there exactly? Well, it's very similar to cartilage and very similar to that poro viscoelastic nature. Um, when they drive over the speed bump slowly, it's being loaded and being compressed for a long amount of time. And there's a lot of time to squish that fluid out of it and actually deform the speed bump, okay? That's what's happening to cartilage when you load it slowly. Like if you take cartilage and just apply this like static long-term load to it, it squishes out all the water and you end up putting large uh, strains on the collagen itself. Um, if you load it quickly, or if you drive over the thing quickly, you don't have time to squeeze all that water out. The water just sits there and uh, kind of because of the hydrostatic pressure in the water resists you and the cartilage behaves much stiffer and retains its original shape or at least more of its original shape. And you get a, a bump when you drive over it with the car if you're loading cartilage and you load it quickly, you simply just don't deform it all that much. Okay? So we may not actually place all that greatest stresses on, or all that greatest strains on cartilage, even if we load it with really large mechanical loads, as long as those loads are experienced for a short amount of time, or as long as we rise up quickly to that large peak load, which is generally the case in, in most uh, kind of dynamic sporty type movements like running and sprinting and jumping and side cutting. Uh, compared to something slower like walking and standing. So this is a really important element of, of cartilage, I think. It's high water content and the ability of it to kind of offload a lot of the strains that it experiences uh, from the solid part of cartilage, which we don't want to damage, and onto that liquid part, which is replenishable and isn't really something we have to worry about uh, damaging uh, mechanically like we do um, about the solid part. And I showed you this graph here before. It's kind of a complicated graph to understand, so don't, don't spend a whole lot of time pouring over this one. Um, but it's basically showing under um, loads that resemble the loads that you experience in uh, something like walking or jogging, which is which is where these data came from in, in tests kind of emulating those things, the large fraction of the strain on cartilage that is borne by the liquid part of cartilage and not by the solid part of cartilage. And you can see here after uh, kind of a warm up period here, which is why, why you should warm up and take it easy before you, you know, do intensive exercise. But after a, a warm up here, of about uh, 2,000 or so uh, loading cycles, which would be you know walking a mile or so for uh, for most people, or jogging a mile for most people, um, you get to a point where the viscous portion of cartilage or the liquid portion of cartilage is bearing, I would estimate, about 75% of the strain that cartilage experiences. Okay, so if you deform your cartilage by uh, say four millimeters, um, three of those four millimeters under normal conditions here with healthy cartilage. Uh, the strain is actually experienced by the liquid part, and only one of those uh, millimeters of deformation gets, gets borne uh, by the solid part. Okay. So we can uh, gain a lot of benefits here from uh, reducing damage to cartilage and strain on cartilage uh, just from kind of the intrinsic uh, passive structure here of cartilage and having a, a biphasic poroviscoelastic cartilage that's well hydrated with a lot of, a lot of fluid content here. Now, I wanted to just end here with, with some caveats in that everything that I've said so far today and so far in this uh, focus on cartilage and osteoarthritis in this class is one particular definition of osteoarthritis, the structural definition of osteoarthritis, damage, uh, superficial tearing in the collagen fibers, the gradual loss of cartilage. Um, that's a structural kind of mechanics definition of, of uh, osteoarthritis. Um, there's also on the other side of the coin, 
the symptomatic definition of osteoarthritis, which doesn't have much to do directly with mechanics and with mechanical loading, but is probably for daily life and for people that actually have this disease, the more important or more relevant to them at least element of osteoarthritis. And these are the symptoms of the disease, uh, the pain primarily, uh, but other elements of, of other symptoms of osteoarthritis like stiffness or just general uh, loss of function of the joint or loss of mobility in daily life. Um, you might think that these things are pretty closely related, right? That the more severe my structural osteoarthritis, the more pain I'm gonna experience, the more stiffness and kind of pain avoidance I'm gonna experience that these are, I think these are pretty closely tied to each other. Um, generally they're not. Um, pain is a funny thing in osteoarthritis and is not typically all that well predicted by structural osteoarthritis. Um, I suspect this kind of surprising relationship here is in many cases due to our difficulty in defining like early stage structural osteoarthritis. Typically when somebody is classified as having clinically osteoarthritis by like a doctor or a medical professional, um, it's based on symptoms, right? They came into the office, their knee's been hurting for a year and is used to just kind of come and go and now it's there permanently. Take a look at them, oh, looks like you have osteoarthritis, right? Um, often we don't identify the disease until it's already progressed to a, a symptomatic case. And so sometimes somebody might have uh, structural osteoarthritis before they actually have symptoms. Right? But you'll also sometimes see people that have pretty severe looking cases of structural OA without any serious symptoms. Sometimes you'll see this in people that are uh, surprisingly young and that look like, oh, something's wrong with your knee here. What's, what's that black thing on your MRI? But they don't have any pain. So is that black thing really that important? Or is the thinness of their cartilage really that important? Eventually it might be, you know, if you lose all of the cartilage, that's a bad thing. But if it just looks like maybe there's not quite as much as there used to be, but no symptoms, then maybe it's not that big of a deal. Um, I've been running pretty, I'm 40 years old now, and I've been running pretty seriously for the last 25 years or so. I guarantee, I've never had a knee MRI, but I guarantee you could take an MRI of my knee and could probably find quite a few orthopedic surgeons and radiologists who would say that I have at least a mild case of osteoarthritis, but I don't have any symptoms. It doesn't hurt, doesn't seem to be any problems, don't have any limitations related to knee health. And so this kind of gets into, you know, what, what really matters here. Is it the structure that matters or is it the symptoms that matter? For your everyday person, for your patient, it's the symptoms. They don't care what the structure looks like as long as it doesn't affect their symptoms or to the extent that it informs their symptoms. Um, healthy cartilage is not typically innervated, so it doesn't feel any pain. There's no ability for the nervous system to tell it, hey, this is painful. Um, osteoarthritic cartilage, however, will sometimes develop direct innervations to the cartilage itself, which is kind of an interesting response um, of the nervous system to damage to that cartilage. So sometimes you will actually see uh, innervations in the cartilage itself, telling it, hey, deforming me is now painful, uh, presumably has some as some sort of uh, protective response. But that doesn't necessarily result um, in all cases from uh, a, a progression from structural osteoarthritis to symptomatic osteoarthritis. You can see people that have a great deal of knee pain and maybe some innervation in their cartilage and which would meet the definition of symptomatic osteoarthritis here, but don't have any obvious or severe uh, structural damage to that cartilage. And so these things don't really exist um, across the continuum here. Um, eventually they relate to each other, right? Like uh, losing all of our cartilage is presumably painful and a bad thing, um, but these are complex and relationships between these two different uh, types of osteoarthritis. So just keep that in mind when you're uh, looking at osteoarthritis through a biomechanics lens here. It's kind of missing the, uh, the human picture or the patient picture a lot of the time, which is primarily pain and uh, loss of function. Okay, that is it for today. We will see you on Wednesday.